Rowan, how are you today? Good. Thank you. For the <laughs> <question>. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, how are you doing? This is the launch. This is it. This is, this our, is it. The, the thing show is ever. happening. We, it's fully happening. We, we've been talking about it. We've been we've been joshing about it. I'm just feeling, oh, maybe we'll do it. But now we're we're here. This is it. Yeah, it's happening. Yeah. No. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to do this. Honestly. Yeah, of course. It's been interesting because, uh, I guess just to to let everyone everyone know what we're doing, we're in pre production for a web series right now. Yes. Uh, for a sci-fi mm -hmm. sci-fi uh, kind of mini series called Niobe. And a lot of the discussions that we've been having is how are we going to shoot? Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. also test everybody like every day, like mm -hmm. every day yeah. people are still going to expect to be tested. Uh, and I know, I know everyone kind of has different thoughts about that. You know, people have certain, you know, people have certain degrees of how, you know, scared or, you know, how some people honestly just don't care about it at all. Uh, what are your thoughts on trying to shoot now? Because people are shooting, people are getting out there. I mean, and the studio system in Hollywood is, is getting ready to go back to production. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it all depends on scale. Um, I'm someone who's asthmatic, right? So I, the way I think about it, you know, it's, it's all about personal risk. Um, but at the same time, I feel very responsible for my community too, where I'm like, if this is dangerous, we shouldn't be doing things. Um, there was a production I was on that was a feature film that was about like high schoolers and whatnot. And they want to shoot in like December. Um, and I was like, you know, I can't ethically ask actors to be a part of that. You know, like it's something that's very you could put up as much protection as you want right now, but we still don't know quite how safe things are. So I think if it's something personally for me, where it's a controlled environment where you could have a very small amount of people and do the adequate amount of social distancing, like, yeah, go for it. But especially on larger scale stuff, um, unless you have the money like Hollywood to do all of that on a really big scale and just be able to really take those precautions, I think that it's something that you really have to consider and talk to the people in your team and make sure everyone else is comfortable doing it, you know? Right. It's almost like you need someone on your crew who has been like trained. Exactly. In, yeah. In, in doing these tests, because I think that's the only way for indie productions to yeah. not get like bankrupted because. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a necessary thing, obviously, to have these tests and to take all these precautions, but it's an added expense. Uh, I yeah. was in a class and my professor was talking about, like, I forget the name of the film or the production, but he was talking about, like, they're, uh, they're reviewing budgets, like, if this is a Hollywood film, this is a big budget Hollywood film there's an additional three million dollars oh per week yeah for, for oh tests just to make sure yeah. every crew member who's on there is tested so i i don't i i know there are probably going to be some people out there who are going to want to take shortcuts mm -hmm. and financially you yeah, can see why definitely. but it's, I just think that one, your reputation is going to be muddied. Yeah. If you, if you decide to go that route, because people are like, oh, well, it really, should be. Well, I mean, you should, <laughs> I mean, you, it's like, you don't really, yeah. you're not taking everyone's safety into account. Yeah. Um, and it's also just trying to navigate this time that we're living in because yeah. we've never had to add a, like to actually think about expenses like that before. I mean, we, 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 for indie yeah. filmmakers, we think about every expense, like every minor, minute expense. Never before have we been like, we got to test everybody before we do anything yeah. on set tonight. We have to test everybody, make sure everyone feels comfortable, everyone feels safe. Normally when, when you've been not, on production, sorry, what were you going to say? There you go. Yeah, well, yeah, and if you're not testing people, you got to have housing for them. So you could all like quarantine together. Oh my 
Like, I didn't you know, like, <laughs> think about that. Dog. You can oh do that, gosh. but that's its own expense because then you're feeding these people, then you're housing these people. You get real close. <laughs> but Wait, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's a big expense. And that's where one of those things, like, like I was talking about, scale. I mean, if it's like a crew of eight, you have like two actors, like maybe then, yeah, you guys could get away with getting tested a little less frequently and just making sure you're spacing yourself out but like that's not feasible for a lot of productions you, and and then you're also assuming you're doing a masked show i don't think it's appropriate to ask actors to be unmasked right now personally um unless you are getting tested constantly mm. it's mm -hmm. one of those things i mean as much as someone might be comfortable taking that risk, I just don't think that it's one of those things we should be allowing for each other, like as a community, like, no, like you should not be put in a position where you are unsafely, you know, unmasked doing this production, you're not being tested regularly or the people around you, you know, as much as you could say you're staying home, it's all on our system. And while I do like to trust people, like, you know, there's still right. enough to that. That's like, we should all know where we're at. Um, definitely. And that's hard. It's hard. And it's hard to put down productions. And it's hard to say, you know, this has gone in a direction that I can no longer stand by because too many people have justified not being safe. And I'm like, I can't be a part of that anymore. Um, I've done that to several, several projects I've been on. Yeah, no, we, we, we've, uh, we've discussed that. We've discussed that yeah. at length. Uh, you, oh, yeah. you, when we were on the, we were on the phone and, um, it was just like we were talking and you were and you were talking about a director who had really completely disregard oh, the, yeah. the the needs and the safety of everybody involved in the production. And that's just that's just not right. That's just yeah. unfair. But at the same time, you empathize with those directors because it's like they're they're dealing with something that they never dealt with before. Mm -hmm. So there's so as a filmmaker. We all know that you have to be thrifty, quick on your feet, like adaptable. But there are certain things that you can't adapt in a way that is, you know, loosey goosey. Yeah, definitely. It's 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 got to be done the right way. I guess my question, and I don't even know if you have an answer for this, because <laughs> I I don't have an answer for this necessarily. Yeah. I only have a very you know. Uh, very narrow view of this but for because we were talking about you know there are crews that don't have just two actors yeah. you know they, they they don't have like like obviously Niobe we have so yes. many actors and so That's many I mean yeah it's a big show we're you know we're trying to keep the crew as you know lean as possible yeah but what would you recommend for productions like that, especially if they're trying to shoot right now? Like, do they just wait until I'm things get waiting. better? Yeah, I, I'm on the page personally of waiting, and that's really, really hard. Um, I mean, I'm I'm a student, like I'm not, I'm in a position where I could kind of be like, I'm in school, like, if I don't do it right now, I can do it later. Like, not everyone's in that position, you know? Some people are like, this is the time I have to do it. This is the money I have to do it now. Um, and I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's, at, man, it's for everyone's separate individual situation. And that's hard. But, like, for something like Niobe, I mean, I would, I would feel most comfortable waiting, you know, for something like that and being like, when can we... When do we have more information out? When do we have more vaccine? When do we have a chance where if we need to split it up into shooting maybe scenes with less people now and waiting for more people later, you know? But it, it just extends time so much. I mean, it's a huge conversation that we're having in like theater too. And, and here's, I think what the conversation really comes down to is who are you doing it for, right? Like, who are you shooting these productions for? Um, it's a big conversation right now. I go to DePaul uh, the theater school and it's a big conversation in theater school right now. You know, if we're putting on productions in a dangerous time in a way where, you know, we have to kind of be in close quarters where we have to be a lot of people working together. I just last night and later today, I'm going to the school to go dress a set with like a skeleton crew. 
um, who are we putting these shows for? Because in anything entertainment, I mean, as much as you're doing it for yourself, I think the most important collaborator in whatever art form you're doing, whether it's theater or it's film, is your audience. I mean, you are taking this story and you're publicizing it for people to see and to relate to and get some sort of message from it. And um, we'll talk about, I, I wanna touch on that more later when we're talking about responsibility of the filmmaker, but um, yeah, who are you doing it for? And when you wanna create this story, there are decisions you have to make. It's like, well, is it modern where people are wearing masks and do we integrate masks into our design? Which I think is a really, really cool opportunity to, um, to design masks. You know, they say a lot about someone um, or are you making a story that isn't conducive of that and you either have to be like Hollywood and spend money um, paying for people or are you waiting it out because um, you have a lower budget or are you, I mean, it's possible to take that risk and everyone be cool about it, but like I personally am not in that boat um, for myself and for others, quite frankly, but yeah, like in a large production like that, you gotta weigh it, you gotta talk to your people and see how everyone feels about it and make that decision based on what's best for your team. I hope that answered your question. It was a little roundabout. No, that no, that was I mean, that was very well, I, I wanna touch upon how theater mm -hmm. is. I mean, I know this isn't a, a theater show, but I'm really curious to see how theater is dealing with all this. But yeah. I I mean I, I liked what you said about you can maybe chunk filming out throughout a long period of time and mm -hmm. chunk out those initial scenes, those very like small confined scenes with very little mm -hmm. actors or people involved to shoot those. And you could yeah. do something, you know, safer with that. And then as time progresses and more information and resources are available, you can start shooting those bigger moments, those bigger set pieces. Yeah. Um, but that that that's hard to ask of someone sometimes. It is. It's because we we all we all have a have, a lot of us have a life plan. Yeah. Like like and and I I don't know. Well, especially just, as young professionals too. Right. And just <laughs> specifically for me, it's like I like know that like I want to get this done by this time. I want to shoot this specific project around this time. Mm -hmm. So when someone tells me, oh yeah, no, the world's gone crazy. You can't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's crazy. I mean, I wanted to shoot Niobe now. I don't know if you knew this. Oh, I would. Yeah, I did. I would love yeah. to shoot Niobe now. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I, I wanted yeah. to do this right now, but, uh, uh, and 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 we'll, we'll talk about that more at the end of the show. But I I I I think as you said, there are things that people can do to at least start their productions right now. Yeah. They can still do pre-productions, pre-production. They can still do all these things. But it's it's I don't know. Some like I've I've been talking to other filmmakers, and sometimes I don't know what to say to them. I'm just like uh either get the best covid testing person ever or yeah. don't or don't do it right now and that's just like the yeah. antithesis mode of a filmmaker a filmmaker is do 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 well come on we got yeah. the people let's go at this so mm -hmm. it's it's incredibly counterintuitive it is and it's it's sad i mean it, it brings me sorrow knowing that that's where we're at like in the world of entertainment you know and like yeah, it sucks, man. It's one of those things, I mean, you got to really like kind of come up with some coping mechanisms <laughs> to like either, you know, get over it, um, accept it. That's the hardest thing, especially because, because you know, storytellers are such passionate people. And when you can't do the thing and express yourself the way you express yourself and especially collaborate, like theater and film, they're both so collaborative and losing that part that's not just you know expressing yourself creating art it's also you're losing your community and your friends and that social aspect of it too it's exceedingly difficult and we were talking about this earlier it's not always easy to just create like there are things that feed you that feed your creativity and i feel like a lot of that gets lost when you can't 
create, like creation comes from creation. I think it's like a Maya Angelou quote, um, if I'm not mistaken, but it's your creativity doesn't run out, you know? It just, it, it, it you don't, <laughs> you always have it. Um, it's just how you're interacting with it and how it's coming to you. Yeah, it's, um, I think, I, I like what you said about you first need to accept it. Yeah. Because I think, I think that's very true for me. Well, and there's a least. grieving process to that. Yeah. There's, there's a grieving and a mourning process for sure. Yeah. But I, I also think that my way to cope was to write. Good. Because yeah. I knew that one. whatever, <laughs> <Good one. laughs> whatever, whatever was happening in the world, mm -hmm. even if I was confined to my house and I, and I couldn't socialize and talk to my collaborators mm -hmm. and people that I really love, which was devastating, yeah. remains devastating at times. I could at least type something. Like I could at least yeah. put pen to paper and, so, and something mm -hmm. could happen. But I will say sometimes that's not enough. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. When and I, and I like to hear your thoughts about this, but when me, you, and our director of photography, Lauren Berry, were talking about Naomi, and we were talking about, you know, production design, what kind of colors you wanted to put in the costumes and in the environment of this piece, mm -hmm. I was so fucking energized Same. after that i was yeah, and during because it was what you were talking about it was like i finally felt after months of just being like by myself with this little thing in my head that i've been writing down i finally mm -hmm. got to like share my deep thoughts on it and mm -hmm. actually manifest it in some real way or at least mm -hmm. talk about doing that and that's what i think people need right now that's what filmmakers are yearning for is yeah. to sit down with other filmmakers and trying to figure out a process to manifest what's in their brain. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, and it, I'm hearing what you're saying. And I, that was a great conversation. Uh, that was a really, really good conversation. I mean, what, it was a three hour conversation where we just like nodded over <laughs> this piece. Like, we were like, yeah, uh, but well, a couple things out of that. First, the first thing I thought of when you're talking about that and bringing it to your collaborators is there's a certain amount of validation you get, you know, from your community. It, it's, you get, a, I have this idea, what do you think of it? And there's the trust in that, there's the vulnerability in that. It makes people very close when you're sharing such these intimate thoughts and ideas that you've come up with. You're like, I've put my time, my energy, myself into this art and you're bringing it to someone. It, it's terrifying. It's very vulnerable. And when you get that validation, you get people on board. I mean, there's something so thrilling about it and exciting and you're all working towards the same goal. I mean, it's so cool. Um, and you get that energy because it's exciting. You know, it's, I think what humans are meant to do, you know, we're all programmed to be social. We're all programmed to express ourselves. And here we are expressing ourselves together with that validation and that acceptance and that those ideas, and we're just having fun. I mean, when you're a kid, what do you do? You make believe, you play with blocks, you create stories with your dolls, or you go through with that, like, you know, those like things for dogs, you stick a tennis ball in it and you fling it, like one of those, you go through like weeds and you're like, I, I grew up in Oregon, there was a lot of nature. <laughs> you're an explorer, you know, going through. And it's the same thing, just now you're an adult, you have more resources and more, frontal lobe development and you could like make stuff out of it, you know? Like, you can actually do something with that shit. Yeah, you could actually make quality stuff that other people like. <laughs> oh man. But yeah, you know, yeah. I I was totally energized after that. I was like, I gotta go, I gotta do everything. Go! Yeah, yes. It's and then you crazy. just want to take on the world. Oh yes. my gosh. No, and, no, and I fell asleep on it and it, I mean, it, it fueled me. For the next couple of days, I was like, yeah, I got to get everything done. Got to do this, got to do that. Yeah. No, it's, there's an energy flow. And, and that's another thing with the COVID thing and being on Zoom that sucks is you don't get that energy exchange. No. I really believe in it. I, we all got energy. No. We all send it to each other and you miss it. No, I totally, it's so funny that you said that. 
this this past say I'd say month and a half, I've been really getting invested in getting really deep into energy work, like Ooh. like Ooh. how to actually like sort of bring energy inside of you that's kind of surrounding you and like energize you and like make yeah. you feel mm -hmm. like ground. It's basically like grounding yourself all the time. You doing like chakra work or like uh, a little bit, like my feet chakras Ooh. and my root chakras uh, in the base of my spine. Um, yeah. but usually I sit down, I sort of just try to like feel that earth energy come through mm -hmm. my root chakra, which I know sounds ridiculous. And I no, used to not. think, no, well, I mean, I used to think like that was all hogwash, seriously. And, <laughs> yeah, then, yeah, yeah. and then I did, I was like, holy shit, this actually yeah, works. Right? Like I can actually feel shit happening in my body that wouldn't be mm -hmm. happening if I wasn't doing this, but not, not to trail too far off but like what you were saying yeah. with like with zoom and not being able to have that transference of energy which uh creatives thrive on and not just creatives but just like i feel like any human being needs it yeah. to some degree you lose that that's why it's so hard to even yeah. just do a fucking hour of zoom like it's oh it's yeah. even this i mean sucks you it sucks at you it's like it's like i wish i wish i could be there with you right now it's like oh, me too. i'm just getting a, i'm just getting like just a you know just this like sheet of paper and i'm just seeing you through it um it's well it's tough yeah, well and the great irony of it i think is that it makes us all filmmakers to some degree because <laughs> you start thinking about composition what's behind me how am i in my screen like when i was setting this up i was like oh this wall is too empty so i hung up a couple of pictures yeah you chose something nice to go behind you i'm really mad at this like masking tape but like what am i gonna do i'm poor you know <laughs> like same dog same <laughs> no it's it it's hard it is so hard and i mean i mean this was a conclusion i came to very early on with covid um for me, so I, I've gone through a lot of trauma in my life, a lot of mental illness. I'm a tormented artist, all that jazz, you know, <laughs> I get it. Stuff is sad in life. And for me, when COVID happened, I was like, well, another great tragedy. Guess we got to adjust to this one now. And, and it occurred to me that for a lot of people, this actually is like a crisis. This is a great trauma for a lot of people who suddenly are lonely and suddenly don't have access to the things they're used to having access to. And for me, I mean, I, I guess it sounds kind of sad. I was just like, well, that sucks. I'll just move on. But like, it, it was something I had to come to terms with that was like, oh no, this is actually very, very difficult for a lot of people who haven't experienced things similar to this before. And I think even for the most resilient of us who were like, oh, I'll, we'll just deal with it now. It, it's getting harder and harder. Um, especially with so much fear and uncertainty around. Like at the beginning, it was just like, don't go outside. And everyone's like, okay, we don't go outside. But now it's such conflicting information. Like you could wear masks and COVID won't be in the air, but actually no, now it's gonna be in the air for hours and we're learning more about it. It's like, well, what what is the truth here? What's actually gonna keep us safe? And the thing that keeps making me angry is I'm asthmatic. Why do I have to go to work? <laughs> like, I don't feel safe, but I have to. You know, I have to pay rent. And so many other Americans are in the exact same boat in much more dangerous situations and much more high stakes situations. And it's tragic. It's truly a tragedy. And not like the government is helping out, but <laughs> Yeah, no, no, the government just yeah. Government I, I has... that 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 could be a show onto itself if we want to talk about yeah, we don't need the to government get into has that, handled but... uh the COVID response. <laughs> but um you said something real. I mean, the, what you're saying is really profound in the sense that, and I, I think I can oh, realize this. Oh, no problem, dog. <laughs> uh, <laughs> woo! Um, <laughs> it's just like, I really felt like when, when it all happened and we all had a quarantine, I was like, well, I'm an introvert anyway. This is fine. Yeah, I could right? just I could Same. just read, I could watch TV, I could, you know, zoom my friends mm -hmm. and just like chill. I mean, obviously it was, you know, after a while it was fucking terrible, but like yeah. Extroverts, I don't know how y'all did it. I don't know how you did God, it. I know. An extrovert. Well, they're not. They're not doing it very well. You know, people no. are playing. And it's I 
that's the thing. It's it's what you're saying is like I feel like as artists who have experienced pain, and you know I don't want to say that like I don't want to give you know make it seem like my story is like a boo hoo story, but I mean I've experienced pain as anyone has. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we we know how to deal with it. We're just like oh I'm gonna be introspective. I'm gonna sit. I'll meditate on. It, I'll think about it, and I can like mentally kind of adjust. I can get through this because I've done this before. For someone who's lived a very sheltered life before COVID where they could do and be whoever they wanted to be mm-hmm. at all times, they lost that. They yeah. lost that means of existing. I mean, we all lost a sort of means of existing, mm-hmm. but they especially lost who they fundamentally could be, if that yes. makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that takes a lot of empathy on people's part to recognize like oh man like this person their personality does not align with this adjustment at all so I got to feel for them like I, I have to understand like when they're mad or irritated or kind of maybe they do maybe they say something that's kind of awful I'm like you know what I sympathize regardless of your behavior I, I, I sympathize because yeah. it's 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 difficult but, and on that too, I mean, I, I, I saw this somewhere on like Facebook, but it was someone early, very early in COVID when people were still realizing everything was happening, the deaths, not that they aren't tragic now, but they hit a lot harder in the very beginning when we were like, oh my God, what's happening? Um, there's been no mourning period as a country. Yeah. Like the government, and, and not that it's their like, not that it's their problem to do this, but it helps, <laughs> you know, but right. there, there's been no national coming together about how sorrowful this is and how devastating, like, it really is devastating, a, a, a terrible thing is happening, and there's been no real acknowledgement of that, and so, I mean, I see a lot of what's happening today, especially with, um, in June, when there was all the rioting, I mean, people are sad, they're angry. They have all this energy. They can't see their friends. Like, on top of all the other injustices happening, of course people are going to go out and riot. Of yeah. course they're going to say, like, enough is enough. Like, listen. Because if they're not listening to a great, like, genocide from this freaking pandemic, you know, and from, you know, irresponsible leaders who don't care about anyone but themselves, you know, of course people are angry on top of everything. Of course, that's been the reaction in society. Of course, everyone's disenfranchised and jaded and just angry because what else do you do with that energy when you've gotten $1,200 to pull you through, what is it, like six, eight months or something now of quarantine and isolation? As a society, it's, it's there hasn't been enough real emotion put onto that and that's another thing that I've noticed in society from what I've observed as a young person as an empath you know as someone paying attention to the world is that there's not enough kindness and compassion right now as a society and because of that we're all hurting Um, and I mean that fuels me as an artist and as a maker but even I like when I was doing a lot of illustration early in COVID, that's how I was getting through. I was drawing a lot. I was making a lot of my own original art. And I was like, how do, what, first of all, what's important to me, right? Like, what are the messages I want to tell to society right now? And B, does it matter what I want to say? Like, you know, should I be saying things other people are saying right now? Should I be reflecting that? How do I how do I express these things I'm feeling with art that isn't my normal form through visual communication, which is so hard, Um, visual communication. God, there's so much that goes into it. Um, And I ultimately like, this is a larger idea, but when you have something like this going on now and just social issues in general, and even just like environmental issues, you know, you, you gotta pick a couple and that's hard. And this is kind of moving into a different topic. I've kind of gone off rail of the COVID thing, but, um, you, you got to pick a couple of those social issues or the issues that are important to you, channel your art into that, and then, you know, spread your message around. But, um, yeah, with the COVID thing, it's been really, really hard to find what's the important thing here that I want to say when there's so much going on. And I'm sure so many artists have had the same experience. 
Well, how is how I'm ready okay. for Obi too? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I guess before we get into um some other things I wanted to ask you, how is how mm -hmm. is theater handling this? I know mm -hmm. this isn't a show about theater, but I mean theater and oh. film have um, a brotherhood, sisterhood. Yeah. You know. Oh yeah, they're all in the same thing. I mean, sorry, theater came first. <laughs> uh, For you, no, yeah. Um, but no, yeah, all that same kind of visual storytelling. I mean, okay, so first of all, before I get into how theater's handling right now, I just wanna say that theater was always, and just like film, I mean, theater was always a community event. Greek theater, you'd have a three-day theatrical event where your entire community came and hung out at the theater all day like for three days, it was a big thing. You know, all those Greek tragedies. Yeah, it was part of how they brought the community together was everyone hung out, it was like sports games. You, you hang out and you watch this story and it tells messages and fables and you know, the integral parts of your society. It's like folk tales, it's like oral storytelling, you know? And you get into film, people are like, oh, this shit's cool. I wanna show people, you know, the train coming into the station. It's wondrous, it's magical, it's cool. Um, and so now, yeah, how we're handling it, um, I mean, like, I think Broadway is shut down. I, don't quote me on this. Um, I think Broadway is shut down until like 2022. Most theaters, I mean, okay, in Chicago specifically, we're waiting for the storefronts that are going to go down. Theaters will not make it out of this. There are theaters that just won't. I mean, studios, there are, I'm sure there are film studios that aren't gonna make it out of this. Smaller, you know, more independently operated places that are just going to die because there's nothing we could do. I mean, entertainment, so many entertainment professionals, not just theater, but in film, they're unemployed right now. All of my friends who have graduated from this theater program, one of them's working at Walgreens, one of them was working at Whataburger for a while, and now she's a teacher. My roommate uh, was working at UPS, now he's doing Task Rabbit. None of them have gone into theater like they thought they would. None of them have done what their degree was. I mean, we're closed. And not only for the safety of audiences, but for the safety of ourselves, you know? and. Right now, the conversation in theater is that, um, or at least the conversations that I've had, is it's like, yeah, if you can get into film, do it, because film's going to come back before theater does, because you can have that safety, you can have that more separation, but theater, it's one room full of people. You could record it. Um, there, we're coming up with a lot of new ways of doing things. One of the things theater school did was a website that was like interactive interactions. We're filming a show like next week that we just put up, the one I'm doing later today. Um, we're finding ways to digitize and make theater happen in a virtual world, but I mean, it's not really theater and the essence of theater in right. what it is, you know, right? And that's hard. I mean, and we have our own protocols too that are all COVID related, but most of it is just you're not unless you're a big company like Cirque just went bankrupt. Like, what do you do? So, I mean, do, do you think that like, I say opening night happens, do you think like you could just have people come and because I know they do that, the, the, like the swap testing where they swap in your mouth. Do you think they could like somehow stream like that where everyone could like have a little test, take like 10, 15 minutes, then come into the theater and then everyone like, is that, is that too much? Is, is that too difficult? Yeah. Why well, is that too first difficult? Of all, first of all, you got to pay for it, right? <laughs> you got to pay for all that. Second of all, we don't necessarily have reliable testing yet. Like, from what I understand, um, like UIC has those little mouth swabs they're trying right now. I'm pretty sure it's UIC. Um, it might be somewhere in Illinois. It might be just University of Illinois, which is UIC. It's fine. Uh, but <laughs> they, they, they're doing something like that. But um, like the CDC hasn't like given it the go, you know, like they're doing their own tests and trials and whatnot. And I mean, it's hard because it's that relationship between, you know, the entertainers and your audience. Like, it, 
it's really hard because you're putting the person who's most at risk in a situation like that isn't the audience member it's the actor who has to see all of these audiences every single night who has to be on stage um who's the one who's getting the most risk and if you have a room full of what two three hundred people like a thousand people like first of all that's a lot of time you're waiting for all those tests that's a huge you need your own lab it, it'd just be obnoxious and it's like a pregnancy test you know you go pee on it and like it's immediately like <laughs> tells you like on top people can self do them but then you're self-reporting and on such a large scale i mean i just i wouldn't feel safe i wouldn't put someone in that position yeah oh yeah and if someone self-report like someone like has COVID, but they really paid a lot to see the show oh yeah i'm They're sorry that ethical to dilemma take it, like, i had covid like you know what i mean like i mean i wouldn't go yeah. but there are people who like uh, i'm gonna see hamilton you know like <laughs> like that definitely yeah no that, then, that's a good point yeah and then recording things i mean there's always the option to record things but then you got to pay the rights theaters don't often have enough money to pay the rights and to go film it and distribute it um and that's its own issue so what are you all doing then uh, is it just a waiting game at this point then well yeah yeah pretty much i mean and then the difference between what i'm doing right now because i'm in an educational facility right so we're not doing it for audiences we're not doing it for profit and to keep ourselves going we're doing it to learn how to do it right so it's a different situation theaters in quote unquote the real world you know they're shafted <laughs> They're shafted unless they could either pay those rights to record or you know keeping employees employed i mean so many people have been laid off or furloughed or just it's hard it's really hard can we i mean can, as a public can <laughs> we come together say if you're a type of individual who cares about theater who wants theater to still thrive when this is all over are there places where we can donate to like theaters just to keep them running, just to keep them going. Yeah, uh, I don't have a base of knowledge around that, but I imagine, yeah, if you like a theater, donate to it. If you know that your arts friends are struggling, like give money to them directly, <laughs> like help your friends be around them. And when art comes back, eat it, like consume it, like put it into yourself and really like, slam the market with supporting art go to the movie theaters um help support the movie theaters i mean if people don't know you know the movie theater is their own independent entity they're not making money really off of ticket sales like go to those theaters and make sure you're giving back go to the theaters just donate if you don't even want to see the show just donate like <laughs> just help out buy local support artists i mean i go on etsy all the time because i know i'm supporting artists you know, if you don't have to buy, don't buy your freaking art from Target. Go on Etsy, go on someone's personal shop, you know, go to a theater and just see what they're doing or ask what they need. Or oftentimes there'll be volunteer programs that you could do where you're like an usher, or you're helping send mail or something like just be part of the community, check up on people, ask how they are. Yeah. I mean that that's the most simplest thing that you pay your do. taxes. Yeah. Yeah, if, yeah if, exactly. If, if you know if you know an artist and you you're not sure how they're doing, just ask her like, hey, what's up with you? I know this is a hard time for someone in your community, whether you're film or theater. Mm -hmm. So I mean, can I help you? Can I just yeah. be someone you can talk to about this? Like yeah that that to me is it's the simplest yet one of the most helpful things you could do for someone yeah and and for the love of god ask before you give give advice because they probably thought of all of the things you <laughs> outside of the industry not knowing what we actually do have art thought of you know what i mean like <laughs> you know give advice within your boundaries of expertise yes. yeah. but but definitely just be someone who's like i i will listen to you my friend yeah that's, you know, I, I can be your shoulder to cry on in, in this moment. Exactly. Yeah. Well, 
It's been a little depressing, not gonna lie. Yeah, we can switch topics. <laughs> we, now. We, can, we can, I mean, I, I think, <laughs> we well, here, here's, here's what I'm gonna do. I, because I feel passionately about supporting what art in any format, I'm gonna look at, at, sites or you know organizations who are trying to fund these theaters right now and i'm going to yeah, post man. it when i post this when i post this video we're going to have links so that people who are watching can actually take action uh and yeah. do something about that I'm into it um I, realized I totally forgot to introduce myself well that's honestly uh <laughs> I realized that as we were going into the yeah, into the, into the COVID talk, I was, I was like, like oh, no. I didn't give her a chance to actually tell them. Them, well, give them. Them, uh, who they are. Well, I mean, let's let let's do that right now then. Um, okay. Yeah, and we could we could cut it around. If we I mean, to. I, I kind of like it. I kind of like the, you know, mistakes. Right here, great. Nice I love it. Yeah, yeah, I love well, it. Well, hello. Uh, <laughs> Rowan Doe. I go by Rowan Doe professionally. Uh, I have a website, rowandoe.com. Shameless plug. Go check out my work. I am originally from uh, Portland, Oregon, just outside of Portland, Oregon. Um, uh, from Beaverton, if you know. It's a great time. Beaverton. Beaverton. I don't know. I Beaverton don't. High School, home of the Beavers, Bucky the Beaver. Our study hall was called Beaver Lodge. I know it all. That's uh, so bad. Oh my god. <laughs> well, and I never thought of that until people were like from Beaverton. I was like, what's so funny about that? And then I thought about it, and I was like, oh, okay. Boy, but, <laughs> you you were like, you you didn't find that weird until someone like pointed it out. Well, no, I grew up there. That's that's, that's fair. That's fair. We didn't make jokes about it. But. Well, the, the worst was when I first came to college. I was like, have you seen Portlandia? And I'm like, yes, I fucking seen Portlandia. <laughs> I've seen episodes of it. And it's not, you think it's funny, but they're not wrong. Like that's, that's Portland, like actually. Really? So that, that's episode not far I saw. Off. No, the, the like vegan lesbian bookshop. I was like, yep, that, yep, yep. <laughs> it, it's not that. I mean, it's obviously exaggerated, but it's based in truth. I love Portland. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, I'm from Portland. Um, I've been doing theater since I was 10 years old. I started in middle school. By the time I graduated, I'd done over 50 productions. I had this crazy director, um, this guy, Shannon Derry. We all found him Derry. Um, he grew up in like the LA Renaissance fairs and doing the fringe circuit. So we'd go to Canada, he'd do shows there. And so I used to act at, we'd go to Renaissance fairs. We had a troupe called the Barty Boys and Nancy Shrews. We'd go around and do our theater and stuff. I learned to play accordion there. Um, I started in film a couple of years ago when my friend um, Ian, he asked me to help him with a film. And so what he was doing is there was a hoarder's house. So I spent three weeks going to the student center in the cafeteria during like dinner and just going in there while everyone was at dinner, like hundreds of people. And I'm just pulling water bottles out of the garbage can and hoping nobody was looking at me too closely for like three straight weeks walking around the building sticking my arm in garbage cans and we made a hoarder's house and then at the DePaul premiere film festival uh, that film won best production design and I said what the fuck is production design and I <laughs> took a class and then I declared my minor and I just made a bunch of connections gotten a bunch of sets and that's how that happened and I've since really fallen in love with film um, <laughs> I know um, I just love that I, I just love that you won this award for something that you didn't actually, even know it's right there where is it oh my god <laughs> my there it is. oh my gosh that's amazing um I yeah. I that's so awesome I just think that's just that's just one of those <laughs> moments where you're just like how the fuck did this I don't even know what this is and I won yeah. you won yeah I was like what is okay <laughs> seeing things that i wasn't even seeing you know what i mean they're like oh the the the, the way like cinematog cinematographic what it words how the composition was, is so yes, good like it works thank you. yeah yeah and they're seeing that and i was like i put water bottles in a room like <laughs> you know I that's all like, you did you just like rearrange these water bottles and you're like yeah just like artistically but that comes easily to me right and so okay so yeah so i went to school theater technology major, um, basically the way that all works, I'm set up to be a technical director. So that means I do all the budgeting. I decide how we're building things. I lead my team. I'm administrative. I'm in the back end. I'm not on the floor as much. Um, and I went in, so the scenic designer takes the script, makes the pretty design, hands it to me. And then I say, okay, this is how we're going to build it. 
Um, and as I've gone farther along my degree, I realized, no, I want to be on the more artistic design side of things. I want to design more and film. That's a good outlet for me there um, where I can do that sort of design work. I never thought I'd be doing design. I never thought I'd be a filmmaker, but I, I love it. I adore it. Um, I do my well, own you, art. I you're really to good at it, to be honest. Thank you. you. Um, Thank you. I mean, I, I care a lot. Like, to be totally honest, that Hoarder's House we did, it was not finished in my eyes. Um, there should have been so much more and we just ran out of time. And I was very upset actually that it turned out the way it did. It, like it looks great on film, but it was not up to the standards I had. And that's a problem I have often is I'm like, it's not usually up to my own standards, but that's the part of, you know, being a young professional and learning how to do things. Well, I think that demonstrates that you're in the right field if you have that attitude. Totally. I feel like, I feel, I think the only reason why I'm even doing this or that I've been able to do anything of any note or have the potential to is because, and this isn't even like me bragging, it's just that I like to learn. I like oh, yeah. to learn things mm -hmm. and get better at things. Mm -hmm. And I'm never satisfied, even though I know yeah. that like at some point I should be satisfied with something. I'm never like, I mean, with Niobe, I can't yeah. tell you how many drafts. Oh, I'm sure. It was sure. like 20 some drafts before we finally, to even now, I'm still like kind of like changing yeah. things up a little bit. I'm like, ah, I don't like this dialogue. <laughs> Sounds kind of stupid. It's not as good as I thought it was. Um, no, but that's, that's amazing. And I, I just, I just kind of want to tell people how we met because I yeah. think it's just such a, it's, it, it was such a beautiful thing. Me and my friend, Jimmy Roberts. We, mm -hmm. we just, we, we co-directed a film last winter. The Ims, as the I call Ims, them. The Ims, as, as yes. you so <laughs> lovingly call us. Um, <laughs> we directed this film called The Climb. It was a psychological thriller. Literally and in the middle of the woods. Literally, literally in, a, in, a, in a cabin in the, in the middle cabin. of the woods in December, <laughs> snow everywhere. It's freezing. Oh, it was crazy. It was amazing though. We were so crazy. Oh, we were God. so insane. We I were had so a insane. massive we concussion. You, had, you did the entire shoot. <laughs> having just suffered a massive concussion and oh, built a, concussion. a basement. You built a crawl, built a crawl space for space. us. Okay, yes. I'm sorry, I misspoke. You didn't build a basement. Okay. You built a crawl space for our main act, for our, really our only actor, there's only like two actors, but like one of our main actors to like yeah. crawl through. Mm -hmm. uh, shameless yeah. plug, The Climb coming out soon. Uh, which Woo -hoo, The Climb. Right now. Um, but uh, Danielle, um, our producer, Danielle, introduced us mm -hmm. and she's like, you, okay, this person, she, she talked about you winning premiere and she's like, you got it, you got to get in touch with this person to do this. And the funny thing about Danielle and I, we had never met before. Yeah. I met, how did it happen? Uh, Ian's films, I met Carlos. Carlos was DP. Carlos invited me to do a music video who Kayla Kraft was the director and Danielle was producing that. And I actually couldn't be there. I was in Oregon basically ordering them stuff off of Amazon while some other production designer was on set. But Danielle was so impressed with my ability to order things on Amazon um, that she recommended me for Caitlin Presberg's It's Not About the Lemons. And then Lemons, I met Will Schneider, who had also won, I think, best something at Premiere. It was like best uh, shot or editing or something. Um, and then van wilson who's another producer and then they were like yeah get this person in the set so then danielle brought me onto the climb and then danielle and i met and we didn't even realize it until we were in the car driving back from the gas station and picking up all the wood from the hardware store <laughs> like it was crazy yeah that's it's it's amazing how just meeting the right person can lead you to so many other individuals like yeah honestly for me it was danielle when I met Danielle, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I the world like opened up. And that's what She's I like to plug. tell. She is yeah. a plug. You gotta find <laughs> yeah. that producer who's gonna She's plug powerful. you to all mm -hmm. those other professionals out there. Cause there's so many, you just need that one person to kind of yeah. get your name out and introduce mm -hmm. you in that way. And that's what I'd like to tell like people who are like struggling and trying to like make crews and trying to like break in. It's like, Sometimes you just got to find that right person who you just vibe with, 
who also has those connections. And honestly, it's Don't be not... a dick. Yeah. Yeah, honestly. Just like don't the be old, a dick. <laughs> the only reason me and Danielle like got close on set is because that set that we met on just had a lot of really shitty personalities on it. But me and her were just like, we're here to do the work. We're chill. And we just vibed on that. Like, we vibed in our misery mm-hmm. with all these other crappy people not to say like there, there are other great people on that set but <laughs> there there were a lot of good people on there were a lot of people there but but uh but there, was, there was there was one different person expectations in particular. yeah i yeah we'll, we'll just leave it at that yeah yeah um but yeah no danielle was a godsend and it it led yeah. me to you which which this has been a godsend just oh it led me to you man like yeah i feel the same way um just doing the climb everything you did for us on the climb and now the fact that we get to do a tv show basically we're doing a tv show we're doing a tv show <laughs> yeah let me just let me just let me just get get this out of the way niobe is a we're, we're we're gonna in the spring we're filming uh spring or summer depending mm-hmm. how COVID goes yeah uh we're shooting a season one of niobe which is a show about this man who is this failed not failed but he's this kind of pseudo retired uh, artificial synthetic designer engineer. Basically, he makes androids, but he's yeah. been released from his job because he committed a crime. And basically, he's, he's he's house arrest. He's under house arrest in his house, and is basically following his relationships with these prototypes that he surrounded himself with, who have replaced the family that is left of, of these women, these female droids. These, they're, they're all these. It's it's yeah. this very um, disturbing relationship that he has with all these female droids around him, and how he sort of discards them, and you know denies them of their sentience. Uh, but it it was something that came to me during the pandemic. Well, a little bit before the pandemic, I had the idea. And it used to be a short film that I made for class, which which now oh, this yeah uh huh. Right, the, the series was actually based off a short film that I made for class and now it has evolved into this thing right now. Um, and it is, I, I, don't want, I don't want to tell people a lot about it, um, but it's, it's, I think as sort of the podcast keep coming, people will mm-hmm. learn more and more about it because oh, I'm sure because we're going to be you know we're going to be working on it but um mm-hmm. it's uh it's mm-hmm. really a blessing that we got the crew that we have for it right now like our dp yeah. is amazing danielle oh, as yeah. a producer is amazing and and i and just so everyone knows i will be interviewing these people soon so you better we'll have them on the podcast i want to hear that i can't me and lauren Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my I god. can't wait for that. Oh, I'm so yeah. excited. But enough advertising. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, actually, could I uh we were talking about earlier about talking about teaching and I think this is a great time to mention that because this team that we have with Niobe, um Danielle, uh who we could talk about forever. Oh my god. Uh, one of the things she was saying when we were at our production meeting was she was talking about bringing in PAs that want to be producers, training them while they're PAs, and then giving them the opportunity to produce over the course of the show. And I was like, yeah. I'm all about that. I mean, it's what we're talking about with this podcast, being about teaching people. My whole plan for my crew, all art department, was to bring in people from theater and be like, hey, you want to learn about film? You want to come in and learn some skills and have some cred under your belt? Like, it's all about teaching and the kind of community you find. And yeah, more than anything, I mean, not just us working together and how much like we love each other and we vibe as collaborators, um, just wanting to share that with the world and give people opportunities to like learn and be a part of something and explore things about themselves and be artists. Um, I'm so excited about that. And this group of people that we are, that that's a value that we all hold. I think it's really powerful. Yeah, just, 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 giving what you have to other people like not like knowledge knowledge is free just give your knowledge Mm -hmm. like why Mm -hmm. what's the point of accumulating knowledge about something about a skill or a craft or a particular field and not sharing it it doesn't really make sense so i mean when danielle was like yo we could i mean we have seven episodes and there's going to be a kind of a different crew for each episode there's going to be variances Mm -hmm. like we'll have different directors for different episodes different producers for certain episodes and 
what an amazing idea was, okay, let's start off, we shoot the first episode, and then as we progress, have those people who are doing, you know, sort of the beginner jobs or sort of like the, just sort of the busy work jobs of like PA and just like getting materials. If they want to step up and fill in those roles, having learned mm -hmm. uh, information and skills from us along the way, yeah. I was so down for that. I was like, oh, this yeah. is an amazing opportunity, especially since a lot of us are ending our careers at Paul fairly yes. soon. To I think give we're all something. about to graduate. Yeah, no. Um, yeah. To really, and as we're going and starting our professional careers, let's give something back. And and as as you yeah. said so elegantly, that's the point of this podcast as well. It's like, how do I, how can maybe someone listening out there, if if people are listening to this, will sit down and they'll listen to us and maybe they'll glean some nugget, some nugget yeah. of information, whether it be <laughs> networking whether it be keeping yourself motivated whether it be finding that creative niche that you love can they get something out of this and that's the whole point i hope that through our i mean obviously yeah. to us this conversation is us just releasing our thoughts into the mm -hmm. ether but yeah, into, the the, void. into the void really <laughs> and but this is this this is what it's all about and uh, i'm yeah. so grateful that this is what that we have the opportunity to do this. Yeah, I mean, it's a privilege. It's the privilege to teach, and I, I really hold that. One of those things that, like, <laughs> I always dreamed when I was younger. I, I wanted to be an author, right? I wrote books. I wrote seven books before I got to middle school, and I mean, like, actual books. They weren't just like a picture book. It was a little bit of bragging on my part. But I wanted to be an author. That was my whole thing, and I always had this dream of my books turning into movies. And then I got to college and I was taking this screenwriting class and I went, wait, <laughs> I could just write a movie. <laughs> you, you could just, no, that's, that's what like, mind blown. That's literally what Do happened that. to me. Oh my, yeah. that's literally, it's the same thing. Like my dad took me to like the DePaul screenwriting conference where there was like, where like, there yeah. were like these, like the person who wrote Die Hard was like doing a panel. Oh my God. And I was just like, holy shit. I've been watching TV and movies my entire life, <laughs> yet it never occurred to me that I could just download a screenwriting software yeah. and just start writing shit. Like I could just start doing that. Like what was I waiting for all these years? <laughs> what was I, know, I thinking? I you weren't. I, I, was, I, I wasn't thinking at all. Um, no, that's, that's, and here's the thing. I feel mm -hmm. like not enough people know this. You can write. You can write screenplays. You can you, you can just do it. Yeah. No, I'm saying you specifically. Oh I mean you? anyone, anyone can oh, try yes. to write. Yes. Oh screenplay. yes. As a you, yes, definitely. As yes, a you, as a, as an yes. individual, as a person, <laughs> you yes. I've read, I've read a screenplay that you were so nice to give me, and I really enjoyed it. Um Thank it you. was uh I don't know if you want to actually talk about the content. Yeah, we can talk about it. Yeah. Of, of, oh yeah, because I totally forgot to mention that in my intro. I'm trans, LMAO. <laughs> right, and and this piece was about. It was about that, yeah. It was basically about. It was basically taking you through the events of someone who is who is trying to like, I, essentially, you know, physically. It's through their transition. Yeah. They're transitioning. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, as a cis member, as a cis. Good, you're good. Male. No, I'm, teaching, man. I'm, I'm no, trying. I'm trying to find the. Yeah, well, this is this is the learning experience. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out the best terminology to use here. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'd love for you to, to just like talk about that a little bit because I found it to yeah. be so moving. Even as I mean, it was amazing because as someone who hasn't experienced that, mm -hmm. I was still moved. Can you mm. can you kind of just tell everyone what that was like about and just kind of your perspective of writing it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say it's powerful that it hit you, and I'm really glad it did. A very quick background on me, uh, just so we get that in the way. Um, yeah, I'm trans. Um, I started hormone replacement therapy, HRT, on testosterone about four months ago. Um, it's really great. I'm 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 non-binary. I use they them theirs or z's and zer, which are neo pronouns, which are so cool and slowly coming into the mainstream, slowly being the operative word. Um, and so this script that I wrote was something for class, right? So I was in my screenwriting class. I was learning how to write a script. Um, and I was like, I'm really bad at coming up with ideas. I was like, oh my God, how am I ever going to come up with an idea for 
a play or a, a script that I like care about. And around the same time, I had decided that I no longer wanted to be buying disposable razors because they're bad for the environment. So I just gotten a new razor. And it was one of the straight razors, right? Where you put a blade on it and like screw it in beautiful wood thing. And so I just got it and I was like, oh shit, I really want to use this. And so I get in the shower. I hate shaving my armpits. I can't stand it. And I was kind of running out of things to shave. So I was like, well, I'm just going to shave my legs. And shaving my legs was a big deal, right? So sometime in middle school, um, I stopped shaving. I just, it just didn't feel like it was for me. I didn't like the femininity of it. I didn't like the upkeep of it to be totally honest, but I also just like body hair and I liked that more masculine sense of things. And so growing up, I had a lot of friction with my parents um, around shaving. They'd make fun of me um, and my armpit hair um, and you know, my legs. It's hard when you're female presenting and you have hairy legs. People think you're dirty. They all the, all the double standards, you know? And so I'm standing there shaving my legs in the shower and it occurred to me shaving someone shaving their legs might actually be a hugely powerful thing for someone in their own gender identity and that script was born out of that it's the story of this person alex and he's you know he's in baseball and he's like this doesn't feel right and he, he walks by this department store and he sees this dress and he goes inside and he's like i want to buy this dress for my sister he's like an only child and he buys this dress and he goes home to his mother and they're talking and she's being a little bit using some transphobic language and he's like I don't know how to express this but he goes into the bathroom and he you know he shaves his legs and suddenly she's Maggie and she's realizing who she is and she comes out in this dress and she talks to her mother and it was, it was very vulnerable to write and it was one of those things where I was like I mean this might not be my exact circumstance but it's the same kind of sentiment of finding who you are and looking for that acceptance from the people you love because that's the hardest thing about being trans and about the experience I've had was one of unacceptance um, that I really had to fight for it and it's a hard place to be and knowing that it hit you as a cis person who hasn't had this experience I mean that makes me very happy because it means I, I did my job right I told a story in a way that was relatable um and, and it was very scary actually sending the script to people who I know are cis because there's a certain security you have in your community, your LGBTQ community, living in a bubble at TTS. I mean, I know so many non-binary people, but like how many of those people are, do you really find in the world at large? You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. that's scary being in the world. Um, yeah, it was very, very vulnerable script about that and about that kind of transition point. No, so thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, definitely. And, um, I will say to 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 compliment your writing. I think why it hit me so well, so much. Even though I obviously I I couldn't relate to the actual transitioning. I've never desired that, but the idea of just being uncomfortable in your own skin, mm -hmm. I feel is something that every human being has at one point felt and can relate to, especially from their teenage years. Definitely. I mean, I was I mean I was a pretty fat chunky kid. Um, same i'm still fat and chunky <laughs> yeah, hey, you're, you're beautiful you're fantastic um, hey fat doesn't mean not beautiful that's true that is true um like and <laughs> um but yeah it was like i just enjoyed how vulnerable it was i feel like even if when you're reading a script even when you can't relate to the exact like situation if you can sense that the writer is, because I mean, I've read a thousand scripts in my life yeah. and you can always tell when a writer is writing from personal experience when they're not. Mm -hmm. And when you recognize when a writer is writing from personal experience, just the way they write, how they incorporate specific details, just the tonality and energy that is being brought to the writing, mm -hmm. that specificity, you just, you're just like, oh, this writer lived this. And the fact that they're revealing that to me is so admirable. Even if I don't fully get it, it's admirable that you're even sharing this with me. I feel like you're taking the veil off and I'm really seeing something that I don't get to see a lot. And that's a treat. That's, I mean, that's a gift. 
Yeah. Um, also, I, I love the fact that as someone who is a production designer, you also are someone who taps into these other realms of artistic expression, writing, drawing. I feel like that's just a, just a great lesson for people is even if you specify in something, if you need to express yourself in another way. Oh, yeah. Go do that. Yeah. Mm hmm. You're not locked into one thing, like at all, by any means. And you know, thank you. And I, I also want to say, like, on that vulnerability thing, like, what is vulnerability? You know, it's just honesty. Mm -hmm. It's just really pure honesty, and it's really hard to get that honesty um, all the time. Well, you you can always tell. You can always tell when a writer or yeah. or a filmmaker is honest or not. Mm -hmm. It's just something that I feel all humans can just kind of tap into. They're like, oh, that's bullshit. You didn't actually, you're just, you're yeah. just making this up so that you can sell tickets. But then you see a film and it's like, oh, wow, I, you're really presenting something that you lived. Mm -hmm. And that's haunting and intriguing. Wow. No. I'm glad you did. <laughs> no, I I really did, and I really I really hope that you publish that somewhere. And, and, and I, I would love to produce that eventually. I've been kind of yeah. who I want my team to be, honestly. Um, mm. on that. Yeah, and my work on that, I'm like, uh, so yeah, I've directed before, but it's been a really long time. <laughs> so. Hey, yeah. I if if you ever have the time and it, and it speaks to you and you're willing to do it, I would I would do it 100. percent Oh, you're on that team. Uh, I would expect nothing less from you. Oh, thank you. well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I wasn't yeah. even I wasn't even overtly like advertising myself, <laughs> but I appreciate that. I would love I would love to to work on that. Wow. Yeah, no, that that'd be such a personal thing to do. Um, well, and I'm honored to work on Niobe because I know that that means a lot to you. Like I mean, that one night I called what I called you at like one a.m. and you're like, well, what? What's wrong?" I was like, "Oh shit! Did I wake this man up." I was like, "You want to play Among Us?" And you, <laughs> I thought our friendship was over. You yeah. were like offended. You're like, "I am working on." Did, did, did I sound that like that? Like that? <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, you were like, oh, my "There's like this silence, this like belated pregnant silence," and you go, "I'm gonna have to pass on that." <laughs> And I was like, oh, I fucked up. <laughs> no, 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 no you didn't. No. <laughs> I, uh, that, that's so funny. I, honestly, I was probably just like, because sometimes I get so zoned in. When anything interrupts me, I'm just kind of like. You sounded interrupted, definitely. Yeah, I was just like, I was just like um, that does sound cool, but like, there's this right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're like, I'm busy. <laughs> But uh, no, it's uh, well. I mean, it it is it is kind of personal, just because it it the piece I was suffering when I wrote that piece. We were all in quarantine, so there's yeah. a lot of suffering and like hard work. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Put into yeah. that. So yeah, I, I I can't wait for people to learn more about that and and learn what we're doing. Um, yeah. But I I did want to ask you. Since since yes. we're, we're, we're we were on the topic of transitioning, and I, I just I because I know we we've talked about this before, and just us, you know, having conversation. What is it? I mean, what has that been like professionally being transgender in in the film in the film industry? I I assume it's probably more inviting than other situations, but that's just an assumption. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. In film specifically, um. Well, it's hard because I've had such a limited experience of film. Like I've only been doing it the last couple of years. And I still feel like I'm, I still feel like I'm not quite a filmmaker yet. Like I can't hold that label yet. Like I'm I still- th I think you can yeah. though. I, 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 yeah, I'm like- I mean like, I'm like it's Meh. <laughs> considering how sought after you are by, by people and especially up and coming filmmakers, I, I think it's, I. I think you've earned the title. I, I think you, you can have it. I mean, I, I feel like I've barely earned the title, but I mean, I tell people that. I'm a we make film, you know? We, yeah. make, we make stuff. Yeah. 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 It's the imposter syndrome. Um, it is. Yeah. But yeah, totally. coming into film, because, because my safe place is theater and I'm finding a safe place in film, um, it, it feels more to me like the real world than it does my safe bubble world in theater. 
um, because I feel like a lot of theater people are just theater people and theater as an art form is typically more liberal. Um, film, you have people from everywhere. Um, it's not usually people from the same cloth necessarily. Like the people I found, you guys are all wonderful accepting people, but I do, I mean, I always have a little bit of fear going on different sets and being like, oh my God, do I have to defend myself? Am I gonna be treated differently? Especially now that I've started hormones and it's like, before I could kind of get away with if someone misgenders me, I'm like, mm, okay, fine, I guess. But now it's like, my voice is lowering, I'm getting facial hair, like it's becoming obvious. Um, I'm, I'm worried for myself as a trans person, but I also know I have wonderful friends and people who will defend me. And I also know that most people aren't like that. <laughs> like most people, they, they, yeah. I, yeah. I don't know that I've ever really, I've been discriminated against overtly a few times, but I mean, I haven't had horribly negative experiences from it. I haven't been beaten up or anything like that, but, um, yeah, I, I find myself in a position, and this is just who I am too, where I feel that I need to be a leader. I feel that I need to set an example. I feel that everything I do reflects on other transgender people um, because there are so few of us and because we're up and coming, um, there's an example that needs to be set and a responsibility to that. And um, I don't find it to be a lot of pressure because I have put myself in that position my whole life. Um, I, I've always tried to be an example and an inspiration for people. I love mentoring people, it's something I love. Um, but it's definitely something that feels to me that it needs to be a large part of my identity for the sake of other people um, and for myself. But So you've chosen to look at it from an almost societal perspective like i am i am being i am being overtly myself so that people who are also like me feel comfortable yes, yes. that's like my whole mantra yeah i mean that's a very humane humanistic <laughs> approach to life really and i think that 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 that's beautiful um because i mean i, mean, I what, believe in society I really believe in society, dude. Really? Like, you do? Wow. I that's, do. That's a beautiful. I, I mean, I do. I'll be honest with you. There are moments where I feel pessimistic, but oh, ultimately yeah, <laughs> I feel like there's, I feel like you can't achieve things of worth if you're not an optimist because an optimist mm -hmm. always has to like, just keep trying mm -hmm. and keep finding the way. If you're a pessimist, you kind of give up mm -hmm. once things kind of like go south in one way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think that I, I just I, I think that that's great. I, I honestly, I just find you to be a very inspiring individual. I think I mean, you're inspiring. I love all of you guys. This thank whole you. Group, like the whole group of us, like I know you know who I'm talking about. It's such a humanistic, wonderful, phenomenal people. I mean, like I'm so glad we met. I really am so grateful that we're in each other's lives no same same for me like times yeah. times infinity is just it's it's just been such a gift and it's such a gift to know that i feel like when i was before i really got into filmmaking i always assumed that like producers and people were kind of like assholes like they had yeah. to be they had to be assholes to get the shit they want to get done and of course that does exist it's you Sometimes know you got to be a hard ass yeah 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 well well and it's such a diverse field film is of like personalities mm -hmm. and approaches so of course within that you're going to find assholes especially once you get to hollywood and then you know you you sort of yeah. get into that realm. But, power is involved in it you're true right <laughs> um although I, I did hear this really great great quote i feel like it was from a very like a famous actor it was like john krasinski or something said this um he was like when you go to hollywood or when you get into like the mainstream film industry he said, like, if you're already a good person, doing this will make you a better person. If you're mm -hmm. already kind of an asshole, you'll just become a bigger asshole. I think it is more power, as you were talking about, like power and having authority over people, it 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 emphasizes who you truly are already. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like if you are a good person and you are given power, you have the tools to be like, oh, mm -hmm. I know how to use my power effectively 
and also be fair to the people around me. Whereas if you're an asshole, you'll, you'll just get your authority. Say you're a producer or a director, you'll get that authority and they'll just be like, well, now I have it. So yeah. fuck you, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want. We're going to do it this yeah. way. I don't care about your safety. Fuck that. I got to get the shot that I want the way that I want. Mm -hmm. And of course, I believe in artistic integrity. Go get what you want to go get. Get the shots that you need to get. But also, there's just a level of emotional intelligence that you need yes. to be a leader, especially in this field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you lack that, good luck. Like you're gonna have a yeah. much harder time getting people around you, getting people to get excited about working with you. Mm -hmm. um, I know that was, I yeah, don't even know what we, we were talking about, but like. <laughs> well, here, I, I have two things for you. Uh -huh. Ready for it? Ready for it? Yeah. With great power comes great oh, responsibility. Get the fuck out of my face. Get the fuck out of oh, my face. Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, the other thing, <laughs> the other thought I had was um, in college, I've had this rival and we have kind of Ooh, we had a rival Ooh. we do no i think we've kind of been threatened for what by each other and my whole beef with them is that you know they want to go be essentially they want to be a production manager right yeah and that which is essentially a producer um but theater you know they're in charge of everything budgets paperwork crews etc and i just and maybe i've just seen them in a different light but I, I, I fear what they're doing. And I think we're very similar. Like I'm a leader. I try and go for the betterment of the community. I try and do this and not to put myself in a higher place, but I, I've watched them bully people and belittle people. And they're one of those people where I'm like, you're doing this for the power and to be in charge. I've heard them say things like, I don't like authority. So now I'll be the authority. And I'm like, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Yes. Like don't, yes. Be, don't be a leader if you're going to do it for the wrong reasons. And no. it, bothers, yeah. it bothers me a lot. Um. Yeah, it's, yeah, but I, I totally hear what you're saying. Yeah, when you get that power, I mean, you either use it for good or you don't, it is the way I see it. And sometimes you have to make difficult decisions that make people dislike you. And, yeah. But yeah. that's necessary sometimes. I've done that. It sucks. I lost friends, but I still think it was for the betterment of everything. You know? um, it, it, it takes a strong will, certainly. And yeah, you're so right about, I've seen so many directors, friends of mine, people I, who I admire, mm -hmm. not handle their leadership authority well. Yeah. Um, they, they don't know how to talk to people. They mm -hmm. don't know how to engage with people with respect and decency. Even, even though they are decent people, these people that I'm yeah. talking about are decent human beings. They just, when they get in that zone, they're like, all that matters is what I'm thinking. And, in a sense, they are right. If you are the director and you are the yeah. creative force behind it, you are right in the sense that what you say as far as how the how artistically this production goes forward, yeah, it is what you believe. It, it Really, your opinion is all that matters. Yeah. But if you want to <laughs> keep people following yeah. you and following your vision, you have to let them come into your world and share mm -hmm. this with you and provide their expertise, yeah. whether they're a cinematographer, a production designer, a fucking PA. If a PA has yeah. a suggestion and they want to help out in some way beyond a, their traditional role, why not, why not let them? Like they could tell you something that you're doing or give you advice. You know, and I know that's not going to happen on a huge set because so many people are doing so many different things. But when you're on an indie set, you should be taking cues from everyone on that set. Oh, yeah. They're your people. You got to trust your team, man. You have to give them that trust and then they will trust you. The biggest thing in leadership is it's all about, I mean, it's all about your own self-reflection, right? And it, it sounds counterintuitive, right? As a leader, you're thinking of the others, but in thinking of others, you have to think of yourself first. You have to think of what is my opinion on this and how does it differ from other people's and how do we make all these ideas mesh? You have to put your own ego aside. You have to smush yourself down and you got to really like do it for the team, you know? And like, I mean, it, that's coming from a little bit of a different perspective than being a director. If you're a director, like, this is my image. Like, listen, I'm asking you guys to do Things that are difficult, are strenuous, are labor intensive, are, are complicated. And there's, 
an acknowledgement of that work and that time and that energy that you have to do as a leader so that people want to do things for you. If you treat them like humans, they'll do what you want. Yeah. And it sounds manipulative, but it's also just like how it works, you know? Like if you're nice to people, if you're kind, and, and don't get me wrong, I have snapped at people. I have been mean. I've been a dick before where I just like wasn't in the headspace. And I, but then you know what you do when you're a dick? You fucking apologize. You take yeah. responsibility. You say, you, 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 I, I don't want to use like, like a, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't the right way, but say like kind of man up. You, you sort yeah. of like, yeah. you, you sort of, you're just like, okay, you know, I fucked up. I, I mean, I've had to apologize for people for shit that I didn't even do. But like, because I was the leader, yeah. because I was the leader, I was like, well, I'm in charge of everyone. So if someone fucks up with another person, if they're, if, you know, if, 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 if for some reason the apology isn't going through to them, I have to be the one to step up and make yeah, sure everyone's okay. I just had a situation with a director where um, I had set a hard deadline on a budget on this one Friday. On Tuesday, um, this director told me she'd have answers for me. Didn't hear from her until the next Tuesday, nothing on Friday. And she said, I thought we were gonna be done on Friday. And I said to her, I was waiting for answers from you. And she said, well, I was waiting for answers from the scenic designer. And I was like, you just threw a student under the bus because you can't take accountability for the fact that you said this. Like, I lost all respect for this person. I was like, whatever, man. Yeah. It's, it's that, I was like, you, I said to her, I was like, you as the leader, I was looking to you to guide this process, not towards this other student, my peer, who was also looking to you. Like, come on. Right. So. Right. You, you, you're, yeah. it's, you have to guide the process along. And, and that's tough for people because a lot of people assume when they get into the leadership role that it's just kind of like, well, now I'm the leader and now I'm going to assume that everyone else is just going to know what to do and read my mind. But that's never the case. It's never the case. Patience and gracious and you got to not treat people like they're dumb. That's a big one. Like if someone oh, yeah. has a stupid question, just take a moment of silence for yourself if you really need to. Or if you're gonna make fun of them, A, make sure they could take it and B, like do it lightly, you know? Cause sometimes that is the, the environment, right? And they're like, the, do I have to staple this thing that's said to be stapled? And you just stop and you're like, yes, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, it, give people more patience than you would give yourself. Yes. That yes, <laughs> that's a good mantra to live by. Yes. I, I hope people who are listening, these are gold nuggets. Yes. Take some of these nuggets. <laughs> I'm not um, but before before we leave, there are two things that I, I really am would yes. really like to know your opinion on. Mm -hmm. and, and really you do explain. Just now for this segment, I feel like I'm really we're really focusing on just production designers who might be listening to this. Please explain your approach to production design. Oh, Okay. I know, uh, I know that is a loaded question. That's a loaded question. But I feel like because of your okay. expertise, it would, this would be helpful. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. I, sure, I have expertise. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, depends on the process for sure. So I've, let me tell you what I've done. I've done technical direction, which is its own process. I've done props design, in a storefront setting. I've done a number of different indie sets. So basically my process starts with the script or yeah, usually someone sends me a script first. So I'll read through the script and I go, how feasible is this? How much time do I have in my life to put into this? How much effort is this going to be? And I decide whether or not I could, I could do it. First of all, that's very important. Manage expectations, manage what you know you could do. Like, and, and like, don't not push yourself, but if it's going to be something like I've turned things down where I'm like, this is a furniture show, repairing furniture takes hours. I'm in school. I can't do this show right now. Um, and there've been other things where I was like, oh, this will be easy. And then I'm heading out there every single week to give them scrambled eggs and it's an hour round trip and it sucks. Um, but I start with, can I do it? And then I go through the script and I make a props list is what I like to do as long as it's a locked script. I'll go through a props list and I break down, I mean, this is pretty basic, but um, what is set dressing? What is gonna fill this room? How much do I need to fill this room? Um, if there's a set already scouted, that's great. I love to look at the location first and say, okay, here's what I'm gonna need for this room. But you look for set dressing that's 
noted in the script, props that are noted in the script, special effects. Um, does a window need to break? So are you gonna need to make candy glass? Um, is there a gunshot? Is the gun gonna be on stage? Is it a sound effect later? Like, how is that working out? Um, consumables, how much money in your budget are you gonna have to put into frozen pizzas that you're then gonna have to make? And how are you gonna build that into your schedule? How much contingency? What are you gonna have to build? Am I gonna have to build a crawl space? What are all the pieces I need for that? Um, if we had that fire effect, I was like, well, first of all, originally when I had the wrong budget number, I was gonna make a flamethrower. And then it ended up, uh, I, I full ass was about to make a flamethrower. I had a, everything I needed for it, it was great. Uh, didn't happen. Uh, but then it ended up, we soaked a toilet paper roll in gasoline and that was our <laughs> effect. You know what I mean? This is for yeah. Um, And so going through all that, and then you start talking to your director, you say, here's what, uh, sometimes if I'm really moved, um, I'll do sketches of feelings for things. I'm like, this is the atmosphere I get. Or I'll do a Pinterest board or I'll find images. I'm like, this is the feeling, this is the mood. Cause it all really starts with feelings, which sounds dumb, but you're using- No, it's images. not, yeah. Yeah, you're, well, I mean, that's all visual storytelling is. It's just feelings, um, really. Feelings and, through images, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you find images that are like, this is how I feel. And then I'll talk to my director and probably also my DP. Usually I talk to my director before I end up talking to the DP. It's just usually how it goes, um, nothing in that. But I'll talk to the director, I'll say, this is how I'm feeling. And then we'll make, usually we then combine our images somewhere. We're like, yes, we vibe on these images. We're on the same page, this is how we're feeling. And then we start talking nitty gritty specifics. So you go from the very vague and abstract of, you know, these, well, first you go from the script and the, the specificity of actual props and the feasibility to the abstract of what is the overall feeling of this, what is the general vibe, and then you go back to the specific. So it's kind of a big wave, um, but that's my process usually. I, a lot of conversations, a lot of smoking late at night, and <laughs> a lot of really like bashing my head into the wall to get through the fucking props list. Uh, not my favorite thing in the world. I don't love paperwork, but it is necessary. You need to do your paperwork. You need to do your pre-pro. It sucks, just do it. Um, and it doesn't always suck. I'm making that sound like a terrible thing, but I do enjoy pre-pro to an extent. Um, yeah. So that's kind of my process. I, did that answer your question? No, that was, uh, that was great. Um, yeah. well, oh, and you know what, that was only pre-pro. My process on set is yes. also, yeah, sorry, I only got up to even the paperwork. You, do, you just started, yeah. Yeah, I just started. So yeah, you do your paperwork and then you find your stuff. I mean, I have good connections and props. I love props. I love stuff. I have hoarding tendencies. It's fine, don't worry about it. Um, but I mean, uh, from my perspective, being in props, I love things. I love the story behind things. I love the aesthetic of things. I love that kind of stuff. And so I have a lot of connections. Where do you get your stuff? Are you borrowing it? Are you building it? Are you buying it? Can you return it? Um, where is it all coming from? So you gather all your shit. You find your crew, you know, who's going to help you find those things out? Who are you going to have? What are their skills um, on World 4 Level 2 for Jasmine, uh, who's also a phenomenal human being, I adore her. Um, she and I talked a lot. We gathered all of our props, shoved them in a van. And then I had what you, I had like two PAs, which were you and John, and then some other help. But knowing the size of your crew knows how much of your work do you need to do ahead of time? Do you sew your curtains ahead of time or can you hem them on site? Um, are you bringing stuff in as the production is running or do you only have one day of load in? Um, are you going to Michigan and you have to find a hardware store because you can't bring all those cinder blocks all the way from Illinois? Like that kind of stuff you gotta think about. And then on set, I, I've actually never not been a production designer on set. I don't know what other production designers do on set. So what I do on set, I'm very involved uh, I love touching things. I love dressing things. I love asking people to do things. I love highlighting people's skills or asking them. I you, usually I ask my team, what do you want to learn? Is there anything specific you want to do? And then I let them do that thing um, because I know how to do it. Obviously, I'm the one who designed it. I'm, I'm fine and comfortable with my skill set. So yeah, like on the climb, building that um, crawl space, I was the only one who knew how to use a jigsaw. So I was the only one who used a jigsaw but I taught John how to use a sander. I taught them how to use drills. I said, this is what we need to do. 
and then guided them through that process. But primarily they actually did that crawl space for me, um, like the dirt and stuff. Cause I was like, can you do this? I need help. So actually a lot of what I do is actually just asking people to do things for me nicely and teaching them how to do it. I mean, it's exactly what we were talking about. Um, and yeah, as things come up on set, you know, just staying on top of what's the next scene, what do I need to do? Oh, okay, we're done with this scene. We're done with this um, shot, this setup. We could clear it, like put the shit away, be packing up as you go. It's like cooking, clean as you go so that you can move on to the next thing. Um, and then I keep all of my receipts. I record them digitally. I also hang on to them physically. I keep budgets. I like to break down how much do I have left, where I got it from, how many of these things I bought. I, I do itemized lists, so every single individual item, what it's for. And then at the end of the process, when everything's said and done, obviously put all your shit back, give it back to people, clean up, make it nicer than when you left it, and send all your receipts to your producer. Along with your budget and paperwork. It's a whole process. I mean, there's no. a whole thing to it. And managing your money is a big deal. Where can you get this cheap thing? How can you build, could you build it cheaper than you could buy it? Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes I don't have access to a shop. Like I could buy um, this like, like cup shelf that hangs off a fridge for 40 bucks or I could just build it out of scraps in the shop and just take an hour to do it, you know? Right. You're constantly judging what's the most efficient and effective way of getting things created. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and working with your team. I mean, it, it's all mental gymnastics. I mean, I got ADHD, so it works for me. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it, it's all mental gymnastics. And it's taking a lot of time to step back and modulate your tone. Tone is huge for me. It's all about tone. Like, if I'm talking to you like this, you're going to react a lot differently than if I'm talking to you like this and I'm asking something of you. If I say, can you go hang that curtain versus, hey, would you mind go hanging that curtain, please? tiniest little adjustment there you could hear it i mean you probably ruffled when i started no, no. when when you started talking <laughs> in in the uh, in the in the in like the, the the first like my babysitting voice, voice. <laughs> that, yeah yeah that's a good way to call it your babysitting voice i was like oh no fuck that i'm not i'm not doing that for yeah. you i'm not doing that for you no way exactly no way yeah. in hell make yeah. eye contact make eye contact stop whatever you're doing stop what you're doing turn to them look them in the face and ask them i'm serious like if i'm on the ground underneath something like seriously just stop what you're doing for like 20 seconds you'll be fine and look at them and say hey could you mind doing that and point at it look at it and point at it and yeah people follow you to the ends of the earth you just gotta not be a dick like th that's my mantra don't be a dick don't be a dick don't be a dick and it's honestly that's not that hard it's not it, it's it not hard and man, I get mad sometimes, but and especially if you're mad, that's another one. Like telling people like, listen, I'm not mad at you. I'm just frustrated. So I'm sorry if my tone is coming up harsh, but I just need to get this done. And people generally speaking will understand that unless they got their own fucking issues. And then it's right. not a problem anyway. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Personal responsibility, emotional intelligence. Don't be a dick. Yeah. No, that that's, <laughs> it's fascinating to hear you like go through your, your process. Cause I didn't even know. Yeah, I guess I just do it. I've never talked to you about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, we've never, happen. yeah. And <laughs> stuff just happens, man. That That's how I view it. I'm just like, I walk on set and stuff's there. It's great. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, um, mm -hmm. I, I, know, I know you got it. You got I mean, you're a busy person, so you got to get going soon. But uh, I have to go to a meeting and tell them I'm not doing their show is what's about to happen. <laughs> oh, whoa. That's what's happening. So I'm preparing for that. Like good, right? good luck with that. Um, I got my team behind me. I got friends who are on the same page. So great. Power great. in numbers. <laughs> um, I do want to ask you just, and we can briefly talk about this, but yes. um, when you say it all starts with a feeling, how do you take that feeling that you get from reading a script and infuse that into the, the, the design? as far as like colors go, as far as wardrobe goes, like those specific details. How do you, I know this is such a, that's such a loaded question, but like how do you extract the emotion that you're getting and thrust that into reality through your work? Well, first I vibe with the director and I ask them, what are your feelings about this? What do you feel strongly about? Or what are the vibes you want? And I listen to what they're saying 
not just the actual items they're saying, because sometimes the actual things they want aren't what they want, like actual things they're saying aren't what they want. You have to hear deeper into what they're trying to get at. Um, and so like, oh my gosh, sorry. Um, so like you with Niobe and the lace dresses, um, I think I asked you, I was like, what kind of lace dresses are these? Are these like lingerie? Are these like night? Like that kind of thing. And then you get a vibe. And off of that, the entire picture starts to come into play. So I spend a lot of time looking at like color palettes. I have a color palette book that I look at. Um, color theory, understanding color theory. One of my favorite things to do is assign colors to characters um, and use that as a storytelling technique or assign certain elements to characters. And you just start building within it. I mean, your parameters are the script and then you slowly push the world beyond the realm of the script and then the characters fall into it and you it, it becomes a larger picture I just have a mind that kind of works within aesthetics you know I'm like oh these organic shapes work with these kinds of organic shapes but since we want to contrast maybe we add harder more geometric lines within that and then you have that contrast you have warm colors or cool colors that are telling different things um it, it's all about yeah, that emotion, like if it's a sad emotion, I mean, think about sad things. Look up on Google, sad images. Like, seriously, it's all about, I, I take a lot of my stuff externally and that's the same for many designers is you're taking knowledge in and you're reapplying it um, and you're bending wow. into what you want it to be. You're taking knowledge in and reapplying it. That yeah. I've never heard it described that way, <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's what you're doing. Yeah. You're taking someone else's information that they've given you, mm -hmm. which is all based in feelings and emotions and you're yeah. reapplying it to a physical. And making vessel. it tangible. Yeah. You're making it tangible. No, that's, that is so cool. No, I mean, I'm, I'm excited for people who will be listening to this to hear that, especially if they're production designers. <laughs> I think that, I think that was a really cool way of describing it. Um, yeah. Man, I wish I had more time with you. To me too. I know. Put me on another episode. I'd love to. Uh, do <laughs> I, I'd love to. I'd love to have you on again. This, I mean, you made this first episode easy for me. I felt Good, like this yay. wasn't even. I, I didn't feel like this was a hard to like talk to you at all. This, no, we're, we're chilling we're vibing this is this is amazing my friend um thank you one last quick question yes, that i'm gonna quick. ask you very quick mm -hmm. um because i know you want to talk about this just i just want to get your like tiny opinion on this with everything that's been going on with the social unrest in in, in america yes. with the pandemic with everything that's happened right now mm -hmm. what is your opinion on the filmmaker's responsibility to touch upon the social economic unrest that's happening in this country right now. Like, what is your view on that? Is it the artist's responsibility at all? Or is it, yeah. I absolutely think it is. Um, you mentioned before, you know, when you were a kid, you watch movies, you watch TV shows, you were involved in things. I think we as entertainers, as artists have a huge amount of power over society um, in a way that people don't usually think about and responsibility to be putting messages into the world that are going to inform a better society. Um, everybody consumes media. I don't care who you are, you consume media. You live in the world, um, you're either reading books or you're seeing an advertisement, you consume. Um, that's the world we live in. And the messages we put out are those messages that we want people to hear. And I think that you have to be listening to people. You have to be hearing people. You really have to be in tune to the larger messages in the world at any given time. And at least giving a nod to those in what you're doing. I mean, art is relevant, especially film. Films are in the world. You know, they're, they're and I mean, maybe it's more realistic film, but wherever you're at, and I think of this from a prop standpoint, the environment that you're in will reflect the state of the world at that time, right? I'm all about environments. Um, whatever room you're in, it has a vibe to it. And so if the world at large, you know, it, it's about coming together, it's about civil unrest, it's about technology and the advancement of technology, or it's a vintage uh, piece that you're talking about, like um, 
whatever values you had at that time. I mean, it, it, you can't avoid spinning values and reactions and the way people interact in society into your pieces. You can't because you know what? We're all people. We're all people who have these innate beliefs and everything we do, we can't act outside of ourselves. We can only come from within. So whatever you're putting out there is what within we are bringing into the world externally and then externally people absorb it and then it becomes internal. It's a big cycle. So whatever we do has to be something that we want people to hear and to understand. Like, even if you're doing a film on Hitler, dude, like there's an aspect of that that is an energy and, and a, a nod to the fact that this man did horrific things. You know, this was the state of the world at the time. This is, you know, you can't really, and I don't believe that there's a neutral position to anything. Like you have to have some sort of bias on one side or the other. And that reflects in, subtly nuanced in ways we don't even realize in how we make our art yeah so absolutely absolutely and making intentional decisions and statements and you know casting um one thing casting people of color in roles that are for by poc um casting actual trans actors in trans positions go see pose on netflix they did just that all of their trans characters were trans people um not even actors people and yeah, it is exceedingly, exceedingly important. Yeah. Well, it, it's also, if you want to convey behavior that you want to see in the world, yes. mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. how your characters behave. That is what is mm -hmm. being communicated. I mean, I mean, I feel like you, you can convey bad behaviors as a warning to people. I think that's one of the yes. great things the film yes. does. Yes, yeah, you, exactly. You, you just, I'm not saying that you can't display characters who behave terribly. That's one of the most intriguing elements of film and art in general. Mm -hmm. You can show the bad side of humanity and then people can examine them and be like, oh man, do I see a part of that in myself? Maybe yeah. I need to like readjust. I mean, that's happened to me with films. I, I've had to, I've had to stop and sit back and just be like, hey, you know what that yeah. what that what that what that villain especially was touching upon. I see that in people, and there's gotta be a way to combat that. So how you perspective. Yes, how you formulate your characters is everything. Yeah. And what you want to say with them is everything. Um, yeah. God, we got through so much. I feel like- Yeah, I know, we did. I know, I feel like I know you- I feel like I know you so much better as a human being. I didn't even know that was yeah. possible, but we did it. Um, oh, thank you. That was good to say those things out loud. This, I mean, th this is historic. This is the first episode of the Courier We're doing podcast. It. And you- you You're delivered, doing my it. friend. You delivered, my friend. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. I love you. I appreciate you. This has been amazing. Oh, I love uh, and appreciate you too. Uh, see, and, and this this is what it's all about. The friends that yeah. you make along the way, the collaborators that you find. This is what this is why we're doing the show. So to yeah. emphasize that and to show that to everyone who's listening or watching. Yeah. I'm getting emotional, yeah. man. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I know. No, we should have a cool down later. Some drinks. But yeah, I gotta go. Um, yeah, if you're interested, check out my work, rowando.com, R-O-W-A-N-D-O-E.com. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Tim. Thank you, it's my friend. An honor. And I'm so excited to see where this goes and where you're taking it. Like you're doing it, man. And we're thank Naomi Gibbs. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, that's definitely so get ready to hear more about that, guys. Oh uh, yeah. Um, and the climb as well coming out this the climb this mm -hmm. sometime this winter. It's once we get the sound synced up, we'll we'll be sending it out to everybody. We'll be putting Every that on Amazon. Grunt. Putting putting that on yes, putting that on Amazon Prime. Uh, Ooh, that's exciting. It. Yes, very excited about that. Um, thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day, Tim. I love you much. Mwah. You too. Mwah. <laughs> Farewell. Farewell. <laughs>